This lecture is a continuation of last week's topic. Last time we witnessed Marlowe and Hastings getting into Mr. Hardcastle's house, believing it was an inn. Apparently, they were deceived by Tony Lampkin. Before we get into today's lecture, I would like to remind you that Hastings had a full disclosure of Tony's device, but he decided to keep his friend uninformed. Apparently, he would like to keep up Tony's device. And this is what we call uh, uh, the proliferation or the multiplication of the device. Now we see Marlo on the stage. He looks unkempt uh, because of everything that he has been through. Hastings informs him that Miss Hardcastle is in here. He felt embarrassed uh, because he looks uh, slovenly, because he looks uh, untidy and tired at the same time because of uh, everything that he has been through. But Hastings um, encourages him. He um, tries to convince him that uh, it is okay uh, to, to receive her slovenly because this is apparently a sign that he is impatient and ardent. Now, I have already taken extracts from um, Marlowe and Miss Hardcastle's um, dialogue so as to, to infer uh, some traits as well as to have, a, uh, to have an impression of what uh, type of relationship they are going to have. Now, after being introduced to each other, Miss Hardcastle starts. I am glad of your safe arrival, sir. I am told you had some accidents, by the way. Marlowe, only a few, madam. Yes, we had some. Yes, madam. A good many accidents, but should be sorry, madam. Or rather glad of any accidents that are so agreeably concluded. Last time, we get to know that Marlowe is actually a diffident uh, and timid character. So we wouldn't expect him to, to start uh, the conversation with Miss Hardcastle being um, uh, that courageous man. Um, so how uh, did I infer that he is courageous in this turn? Because he ended his turn with this phrase that are so agreeably concluded. that are so agreeably concluded. Okay, so apparently he starts to flirt with her from the get-go. But also his weak personality, also his timid uh, and diffident personality uh, shines through his, his dialogue with her. Um, uh, how did I infer that? Um, I inferred it from uh, the fact that he has lexical repetition. Um, you notice here in this turn, he repeats several words over and over. For instance, madam, it has been received several times. Uh, the word yes has been received so, uh, uh, repeated uh, several times, um, as well as um, uh, the, uh, the same idea, only a few madam, yes, we had some. Okay, as well as from the fact that he looks uh, hesitant in here. You see these spaces between, between the words and the phrases. These are indications that he is uh, feeling hesitant. Uh, hesitation marks uh, are those pauses before we start to talk or as we uh, are talking. So um, uh, in, in this turn, we see a mixture of Marlowe being um, a courageous man that starts to flirt a lady from uh, the very beginning, but at the same time, we see that his personality, his weak personality, his diffident psych shines through the dialogue as well. Now, we have other things to... Um, uh, in, the, in this dialogue, for instance, we have this turn, Marlowe gathering courage, I have lived indeed in the world, madam, but I have kept very little company. Now, he tries to show her some aspects of his personality. Now, he, he tries to, to tell her that he is um, 
uh, unsociable uh, human being, that he doesn't like social gatherings. Um, uh, he is introverted in nature because although he has a vast experience, he has kept very little company in his life. You are a relatable man. You are relatable. He also uh, tells her that, uh, that he has uh, been an observer upon life rather than enjoying life um, like uh, other people. From this, we also um, conclude that or she um, uh, is given the chance to conclude that he is uh, an introverted, that he is unsociable, that um, he is um, not the type uh, of people that um, can live life uh, aimlessly, if we may put it in this way. Now I have this uh, observation at the very end of their dialogue. Or before the end of their dialogue, I, um, the, uh, the observation is, this is marvelously put compared to his shrinking, diffident nature. And yes, if, if you have an idea about a man being timid and embarrassed and shy, you wouldn't expect him to put his ideas in such a marvelously phrased language. But apparently, Marlowe succeeded in that. Um, from this dialogue, we, we infer that he is either um, more courageous than we expected him to be, or he is less timid than we expected him to be when he meets uh, Miss Hartcastle. Apparently, both. Now we see Neville and Hastings leave the stage, and here we witness the first spark of compatibility between Kate and Marlowe. Because um, if you think about it, when we talk about matrimony, about a matrimonial relationship, when we talk about marriage, we actually do not only um, think of uh, being physically matching or of being uh, uh, of a uh, equal social status, but at the same time, we think about um, uh, having a sort of um, uh, mental compatibility because it is easier and smoother in a relationship when um, the the man uh, and the woman having the same values in life, having the same value system, they appreciate and depreciate the same things. Um, Apparently, um, Hastings, uh, sorry, Miss uh, Hartcastle uh, and Marlowe um, are compatible, uh, compatible in that department. Now, uh, how did we infer such a thing? Um, now they are uh, speaking about uh, having conversations with other people. They agree that uh, having a shallow conversation is not satiating for them. Um, they um, like to have or they prefer to have a grave and sensible conversation. And they cannot imagine to, to feel fulfilled and satiated by a conversation that is shallow and, uh, and airy. Okay, notice this extract between, um, Mrs. between Miss Hartcastle and Marlowe. Miss Hartcastle, I have been surprised how a man of sentiment could ever admire those light, airy uh, pleasures where nothing reaches the heart. Apparently, Kate is a, a prudent, uh, open-minded, um, as well as a sensible uh, woman. And uh, at least uh, she would um, uh, like to marry someone that is compatible with all of these traits. Marlowe replies, it is a disease of the mind, madam. In the variety of tastes, there must be some who wanting a relish for mm, mm, mm. Okay, these sounds at the end of his uh, turn indicate that he is still he uh, hesitant and that his diffident psyche is showing up. Now, uh, they go into uh, an even uh, more uh, uh, serious and 
grave i wanted to say yes grave uh, conversation they uh, talk about uh, the, the hypocrisy of their age uh, you know the word hypocrisy you can check it up if you do not know about it um the adjective uh, from the word hypocrisy is hypocrite hypocrisy hypocrite she says that uh, she cannot believe that there are people on this planet who, who preach something, but they do the opposite. Uh, some people um, do not stick to their value systems. They do not stick uh, to their values, okay? Because um, in the public, they criticize um, uh, others for doing something, or they even castigate them for doing something, okay, as uh, as it is wrong um, or not the right thing to do. But actually, in a private, they are not ashamed of doing it, okay. So this hypocrisy, showing people something and uh, or criticizing something in public, whereas they are doing it um, in a private, is a shameful. Uh, form of hypocrisy that uh, that stains their age now uh, notice this there are few that do not condemn in public what they practice in private marlo replies to this saying those who have most virtue in their mouths have least of it in their bosoms um, the gist of it practice what you preach practice what you preach or do not preach at all if you cannot stick to your preaches and practice on them, practice on uh, or act on your ideas and values. Uh, at the very end, uh, Kate concludes that Marlowe is a very agreeable man, that he has a good sense, he has a good mind, um, uh, also that he is very polite, um, uh, because he uh, didn't uh, look into her face and apparently not looking into a woman's face is a merit that he is um, praised for. Now we see Tony and Constance on the stage. Um, uh, Constance is crying, uh, and Tony is uh, there telling her to, to, to stay away, to not uh, have anything. He doesn't want to have anything to do with her. So apparently they are fighting. Uh, they are having um, a squabble, a quarrel. They are quarreling on the stage. And we do, don't yet know what they are quarreling ab about. We will know this later on. Now, we see uh, another uh, uh, encounter in here between Hastings and Mrs. Hartcastle. You know from the previous lecture that Hastings has a plan in mind. He would like to elope with Constance. Okay? He would like to elope with Constance to Paris and start a family there. Why they cannot do it in the traditional, customary way? Because uh, Mrs. Hartcastle set up or worked out a plan to, um, uh, to set up uh, Tony and Hastings uh, in a wedlock. Um, both of them, Tony refuses, rejects um, to take uh, Constance for a wife and Constance rejects to take Tony for a husband. Um, uh, at the same time, there, there is uh, an uh, obstacle, an impediment, um, which is the fact that both Tony and Constance not uh, yet uh, are coming of age, so their fortune as well as all the decisions, uh, all their legal decisions are in Mrs. Hartcastle's custody. So she is um, uh, taking everything to her advantage. Now, we see the beginning of a new device in the play. Um, uh, I talked about this previously. We have a primary device that is performed by Tony, but we also have other devices. This time we, we notice the, the initiation of a new device that is uh, planned out by Hastings. Okay, let's see what is going on. 
Now, we see that Hastings showers Mrs. Hartcastle with compliments. Um, and the reason why it works with Mrs. With Mrs. Hartcastle uh, is because she is the type of woman who likes to be appreciated, who likes to, um, to grab attention, who likes to, um, to dress in her finest attire uh, and uh, to wear her finest uh, jewelry. Okay, so Hastings in here uh, taking advantage of, of these um, desires that are um, inside of her. Okay. At the same time, Miss, uh, Mrs. Hartcastle um, feels uh, relevant to uh, upper class society. She does not feel uh, relevant uh, to um, to the working uh, class society that she lives among. She feels that she is uh, better. She feels superior. To, to the villagers that she lives uh, among. So when she is when she is praised for being, um, for looking like a woman uh, from um, a higher social class, she feels thrilled. And this is exactly what, what Hastings is doing right in here. He is complimenting her dressing. He is complimenting her hair dressing. He compliments her sense of fashion. And he also showers her with with compliments um, that she looks um, uh, relevant to London upper class society, not to those shabby uh, or shaggy, uh, both, it works both, shaggy and shabby um, villagers that she lives among. And of course, she is pleased or beyond pleased to hear all of that. Now, Hastings uh, is trying to win her approval, okay? He feels it is easy to get into her. Now, she asks uh, Hastings uh, about the latest uh, trends in London because she likes to imitate all of, all, all of the, uh, the fashion trends uh, in London upper class society and she asks him about um, the fashionable age uh, in London um, the fashionable age is the age in which a woman is praised for wearing her finest attire and her jewelry so he tells her that the fashionable age last, last winter was 40 uh, t uh, the coming winter, the fashionable age, in the coming winter, the fashionable age is 50. Now, a woman like Mrs. Hartcastle cannot keep her mouth shut. Of course, she is going to grab other people, to drag other people into the conversation. Show. show. So, uh, she started to to speak about Constance saying that she is not yet coming of age and she is not um, um, she is not yet um, the fashionable age and she wants her jewels back okay so she is castigating her niece at the same time she speaks about uh, about Tony and how uh, unthankful he is as a son and she talked about them being contracted to each other you know, in some families, when um, two uh, children are born around the same age and they are relatives, so uh, their family sets, sets them up for marriage um, from a younger age without waiting for their consent. Okay, as if it is their, uh, as if it is up to them to decide about other people's life. Okay. Mrs. Hay uh, Mrs. Uh, Hartcastle is one of those women. She... Uh, trapped uh, her son and her niece um, she is trying to trap them into a wedlock now Tony is a provocative I have written in here that Tony is a provocative provocative from provoke the verb provoke provocative okay uh, so Mrs. Uh, Hartcastle, of course, uh, saw them both uh, 
uh, Tony and uh, uh, and Constance fighting and quarreling, but she apparently that uh, uh, type of people who who tend to overlook the things that they do not like to see. She is one of those people. She saw them quarreling and fighting on the stage, but now she tells him, um, or she asks him, um, what sort of things did you uh, did you tell uh, uh, your uh, your cousin? Um, he says, I know not, not I know no soft ways to tell uh, nobody. Okay, I belong to the to the stable. He, he says in, in this way that um, he has no place but the stable. And this uh, tells a lot, my friends, why? Because when Tony says that his place, his only place is the stable, he is not humiliating himself at all. He is not humiliating himself. Uh, this is not a derogatory phrase to describe himself. He says that because he feels like that he is being real in here okay he knows where he belongs to he knows that he belongs to the to the three pigeons the ale house he knows that he belongs to the stable where he can play pranks on the animals okay he is being real in here and funny at the same time this is sarcastic when somebody says I belong to the to the stable or I have no place but the stable okay now we see that uh, oh, okay b before we, we proceed into this um, we have also a scene in which uh, Tony uh, throws something at Constance head and she almost cracked her head uh, open and I've written in here that it, uh, it was unmanly. Of course it is unmanly, but um, the reason behind such, uh, such a scene is not actually, uh, uh, it is not malicious, if I may use this word. It is not uh, because um, of a vicious uh, feeling uh, towards her, not because he abhors her, but um, such scenes are um, smuggled uh, into the play so as to, to induce laughter, okay, if that makes any sense. Because it is funny if you, uh, if you notice uh, two characters are having a dialogue um, and there is another character that, that throws uh, a stone or, or, or a piece of furniture on uh, someone's head, uh, okay? or at someone's, uh, uh, to crack their heads open. So it is sarcastic. We conclude it is sarcastic, but genuinely it is very unmanly to hit a woman. Okay, we overlook that, Sony, we overlook that. Now we have uh, Mrs. Hartcastle complaining um, and whimpering over uh, the fact that Tony is uh, very ungrateful as a son and now we uh, come to the uh, to the pinnacle uh, of uh, Hastings um, device here at uh, at the end of act two Hastings wants to make sure that Tony rejects uh, Constance for good and um, that he rejects to take her uh, for a wife um, very honestly, okay? Um, so he asks Tony um, whether he, he wants uh, to take or what he thinks of Neville and here we have Tony describing what he thinks of Neville. Okay, and these are not a very pleasant descriptions of his cousin, but we forgive him, we forgive him. Tony says that um, Neville is the type of crying, uh, is a crying woman. She cries over a book and the, the more that it makes her cry, um, the better. 
okay? I hold back my opinion on this Tony. I hold back my opinion. Tony expresses um, contempt towards his cousin, saying that she is the most bad-tempered woman in the Christendom, okay? And that she has as many tricks as her. Now he likens her to animals, okay? You see, by the way, his language in here is really dense and metaphorical, dense and metaphorical as sarcastic, definitely. Okay, he also describes her, uh, describes her uh, as loud as a hog. As loud as a hog. So, um, you see that all these descriptions are derogatory. But, I can confidently say um, that they are sarcastic. It is sarcastic to describe people in, uh, in such a manner, although it is genuinely humiliating. So I hope that uh, you get what, what I mean. Um, he also starts to compare her to, to someone else. We talked about this um, in the previous lectures. We said that he admires a, girl, uh, a country girl called Bet. Now he compares uh, uh, Constance to, to this country girl, Bet. And in his opinion, uh, Bet is so much more beautiful than Constance. Uh, so he describes his girl art as, has a pair of eyes as black as slows. As black as slows. Slows, um, a type of blackberry something like, like um, uh, a sort of berry. And also he describes her cheeks. He says that her cheeks are as broad as uh, a pulpit uh, cushion. So apparently from this we conclude that Constance doesn't fit into his, into his own standards of beauty because we have to accept that not all uh, we do not fit into all people's standards of beauty or into all people's standards of uh, of thinking okay so it is okay uh, constance is not his type now hastings feel feels relieved um tony really does not uh, want this uh, uh, this woman uh, Constance. Now uh, he is encouraged. He Hastings is encouraged to um, to to spark the conversation um, uh, of um, his bargain. He says, "I have a bargain for you. I will take Neville forever. Okay, you are not going to to see or hear from her uh, for good. But you have to cooperate with me. You have to be part of my plan." to get her jewels back and elope, to which Tony agrees. And he says, I will be of help to you to the last drop of my blood. So uh, from this, we conclude that Tony is really, um, really genuine about his feelings towards his cousin. But it tells us also that he is a loyal lover. Maybe he is doing all of that because of his love to bet. Maybe if, uh, if Constance was his only option, he wouldn't think of her like that. Don't you feel that Tony is a is very entertaining character to read about? Now we are almost halfway through our uh, play. She stoops to conquer. We are halfway through. Uh, next time we start off Act 3 of She Stoops to Conquer. If you, have, if you have any question, you know where to go. Also, I would like to know that I do all these lectures myself. Like, I do the summaries and I um, also read articles to, to include in here. So uh, except for our Google Classroom and our uh, Telegram channel, you won't uh, be able to find these lectures. Stay well.